Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today from the great state of Maine, where life should be, is historian Tom Desjardins. Tom, how are you today? I am wonderful in the great state of Maine. It's a typical kind of drizzly fall day. The wood stove's cranking and everything smells and feels better. Oh, boy. It already feels like my childhood. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So I've invited Tom to join us today because, uh, of course, as folks know, uh, the 30th anniversary of the movie Gettysburg has just been uh, past us. And uh, Tom has done a lot of writing about that. Um, but kind of as a little asterisk to Tom's wonderful work on uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the movie Gettysburg specifically, um, years and years ago, I worked as a reporter in Bangor, Maine at a radio station. And Tom consulted on the movie Gettysburg. And I called him up and I interviewed him for the radio one day. And uh, 30 plus years later, I thought it'd be kind of cool to close that loop. So uh, Tom, I, I don't even know if you even remember that interview, Tom. I kind of, not, I don't know about that one specifically, but just that it was this crazy time. There was an article in a newspaper or something. And um the movie was going to come out. It actually premiered here in Maine the night before the big premiere. And um, so all the local, you know, newspapers and people and just the Boston Globe and, you know, the regional stuff were like looking for an angle on a movie that had Mainers in it. And uh, so I got a bunch of phone calls and stuff. Yeah. So how was it that you first got involved in consulting on that film? I um, spent two years living in Kentucky between my... I needed time off from college. So after my master's and before my doctorate, I was in Kentucky for a couple of years and had been in touch with Ron Maxwell. Um, they were, this is the funny periods, back when it was going to be a TV miniseries. And I mean, intentionally from the start. And, you know, Chamberlain was going to be Don Johnson and then Tom Selleck and whoever the flavor of the week was, you know, it was a, a TV movie, you know, kind of thing. And so it didn't really matter who looked like Chamberlain, but who was the the you know, biggest famous person at the time. And um, and then it moved on to Kevin Costner for a while. And then he made a movie with a mustache and a union uniform and, and that and the price tag after, you know, whatever it was, eight Oscar nominations put him out of the race. Um, but I would write to Ron and say, you know, please don't have guys in fancy brand new uniforms, all dark blue and clean shaven, you know, um, cover them with dirt make their hair greasy, make their teeth look bad, you know, um, to, to try to, if you're going to do the movie, try to make it look like, like it looked as much as you can, you know, not, uh, like I said, the, the central casting sends out everybody, wardrobe sends out everybody brand new uniforms, it will go get them dirty somehow, ruin them. And, um, and so I, I'd send him a number of things and a little bit about Chamberlain and, um, you know, some of the things nobody really knew about him back then. But I was also a little delicate um, about this was a movie about a novel. It was not a movie about Joshua Chamberlain, the real person. And it was important to really to not blur those lines too much. The movie tried to occasionally, and that's when it, it got a little thin. You know, you have to kind of make a choice. This is a movie about a novel. It's not a movie about what we think really happened. That would be a different movie. And um, people love the Killer Angels and they love Michael Shara and his writing. And it, it, it needed, I thought, to be true to that. So I kind of, you know, said, well, you know, there's little things like what shoulder bars Chamberlain was wearing in Gettysburg because he was still a lieutenant colonel until literally the night before the battle. And whether or not he could have gotten hold of some colonel birds, you know, just interesting. Like what kind of hat he wore, um, which is a, is a funny Don Troiani story there. But um Don never painted a hat on him because he could never determine which hat he was wearing, and neither could I. And so after Don did that, you never see Chamberlain in a hat in a movie, in a painting, because if, if Don can't figure it out, nobody could. And so um, in the movie, he took it off because he, so he wore one. It was probably still a kepi, um, it's sort of a, a bummer, you know, a half a forage cap. So things like that. And I would just say, well, he probably wore this, but here's you know, some some of that sort of stuff. And then I um, came home from, gosh, I came home from the Army in July of, no, it was uh, June of 92. And I had some time off and it was home when the phone rang. And um, I answered, hello, hi, this is Jeff Daniels. I've just been cast as Joshua Chamberlain. I'm going, Jeff Daniels, Jeff Daniels, Jeff Daniels. And um, I had lived in at Florida State in Tallahassee. Um, and Jeff filmed the movie Something Wild. Yeah. Um, in town and you know Tallahassee was a huge city and so everybody you know every day the newspaper well they filmed over here and they filmed over there 
and it was a cast of like four you know it wasn't a big uh you know braveheart kind of movie so you, you didn't really see the whole cast there were like three people in it at any one scene i was like i kind of remember the guy and i was like wait he was that arachnophobia guy and i hadn't seen it but that was like the last movie had been out like i, I can kind of see him in my head so i said to him like everybody who called and said i want to know about chamberlain i said you got to come to Maine." A couple of a week later, if that, he was getting off a plane and and at the Portland International Jet Port. It's international because it flies up when when the flight to Quebec every week, so we call it international. Um, in a Hawaiian shirt and um, hacky pants and a ball cap. And I remember standing, you know, outside as they, they walk across the runway. You know, you walked out off the little planes back then. And I'm going, you know, what's he look like? What's he look like? As you know, was he going to look like Chamberlain? And um, he had a ball cap and a Hawaiian shirt and khakis on and offered me some yogurt. So uh, that was the first, <laughs> the first moment. So I, I suspected, I later learned that, that Ron Maxwell had said to Jeff, you need to go talk to at least this guy in Maine. I was just about to start my doctoral work on it in that September. And I actually missed the scenes filming of the 23 and I was there for the biggest charge stuff and missed the 23 scenes because I had to go back to school. So I met the, it, it turned out okay because Jeff and I spent a good deal of time when neither of us cared. Uh, watching Pickett's Charge filmed, be filmed was fascinating, but he didn't have to be there so we could talk and wander. And he brought his whole family, his kids and his wife and everything. And so um, he was a little shook up about the fact that Pickett's Charge was this big thing and the explosions and it was this, you know, giant. And his part was small and a couple of guys on a hill and it was kind of bothering him even then. I was like, don't worry about it. When, when, you know, it's, <laughs> if you read the novel, Pickett's not that deep. And um, but he's fascinating, hilarious kind of character. It, it, you know, people will emote just as strongly inwardly from your role as they do from just the you know, pure cinematography of guys blowing up trying to cross the Emmitsburg Road. Um, so we had a lot of conversations about accents and and things. And I again tried to stay away from years later. Um We've talked a number of times about what I didn't tell him. And any kind of, it's not mad at me, but he laughs about it. Um, probably the funniest example is, not a lot of people know this, Chamberlain at Gettysburg was suffering from a really bad case of a malarial fever, which he had recurring bouts with the rest of his life. And probably because almost all the officers had it dysentery from the bad water somewhere in Virginia. Well, the primary symptom of, I'm going to ruin the Chamberlain image for everybody here, but the primary symptom of dysentery is violent diarrhea. And Hollywood wasn't ready for that in their lead character in 1992 or three, but it would have been realistic. And probably not till Saving Private Ryan is, is Hollywood, if it is now, ready for raw reality of war. Um, but so I, we have often joked later with Jeff, I said, you know, I never told you that Chamberlain's probably the biggest distraction at Gettysburg was his stomach, you know, his um, intestines and so on. And then, of course, two movies after Gettysburg, he filmed Dumb and Dumber with the big toilet scene. And so I've said, you got the right scene, just two movies too late. And so we've laughed about, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but so we, I, I tried not to. We had lunch. He came to Gettysburg. I took him to Bowdoin College. And I laid it on pretty thick. We went to Ch Harriet Beecher Stowe's home, where she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And uh, her husband was a professor. And when Chamberlain was a student, he was of Professor um, Calvin Stowe. He would have Saturday nights. He would invite his, his students over, which is really unusual in that day and age, in that educational way. Um, and they'd sit around cross-legged on the floor and they'd read or write or recite and talk about their studies. And so one day he asked his wife to come down and read from this story she was writing called Life Among the Lowly. And she did. And later they found out that it, it, he's Chamberlain and his classmates sat cross-legged on her parlor floor while she read out loud from Uncle, the unpublished version of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so I, I took him to the parlor, which is a, the house was a restaurant then. And I told him that story and he just kind of froze up. <laughs> and he was like, but suddenly realized this is not just a person. It was the first time he'd ever played a real person that had lived. But it wasn't just somebody he'd never heard of. This was like a kind of an important guy. And um, so I remember this a lot. We've talked about this a lot since. But at lunch, um, I kind of just, we sat down and got settled. And I just kind of started giggling a little bit. He said, what? And I said, you're about a foot too tall. And he kind of laughed. He said, well, 
what do you mean I'm a foot too tall? I said, Chamberlain was exactly 5'7", and uh, which was perfectly normal for his time. And you're not. And he said, well, he's going to be 6'3". <laughs> and I said, he goes, there's some things even Hollywood can't fix. And, and it was early on, it, it occurred to me, of course, he's six foot three, blonde haired, blue eyed, because that's the Chamberlain Michael Shower wrote. In reality, he was five foot seven, fairly small, skinny, stricken with diarrhea. Just, you know, he, he was, and I've always thought from my childhood, that's what made what he accomplished in his war years, particularly so much more important and so much more fascinating because he wasn't already built and, you know, born to be the heroic character. He was not physically that guy. And so um, it, it interested me then. And um, so we spent some time together on the set and talked about a bunch of things, accents and boots and shoulder bars and, and what have you. And then I went home. Just I didn't get to see the little round top scenes and, uh, until they were filmed. And, uh, and I got to say, uh, uh, Jeff did something really, really great. The Chamberlain home, uh, where he lived most of his life, across the street from Bowdoin College, is a museum. And um, he, um, Jeff asked the, the producers of the movie to send a copy of the film to Brunswick um, the night before the, the um, real premiere in Washington. And they had two showings of it. And he flew at his own expense on his way to Washington to, to attend these events and meet people and and they raised enough money as a result of it to rebuild a very complicated historical glassed-in porch on the house, which would never have been done. They never would have found the money anyway, otherwise. But he, it was really great of him. And at his own expense, he, he diverted himself from Washington. He got there for the premiere there, but he had made these arrangements to, to make this happen. And it was a really, we always still call it Jeff Daniels Porch at the Chamberlain House. But um, so it was a kind of a really nice way of paying back. He was terrified. Um, of playing the role and worried about how people in Maine would think because they, he knew what it meant to people up here. And he didn't, before he took on the role, he came and visited and was like, oh my God, these people think he's amazing. And um, they said, yeah, so don't screw up. So, so, <laughs> so we had, and we've had a, a lot of fun. He, he still comes to Maine every you know, third year or so. Um, and we still catch up. Um, and he just discovered this year, a couple months ago, that his ancestor, his direct ancestor, was in the 24th Michigan on the Iron Brigade on the first oh. day. And I said, well, next time we go, you show me what happened on the left flank on this first day. And then we'll go visit the second day's flank and we'll compare notes. So, uh, so he just, I said, well, you're, you know, you're descendant royalty when it comes to the Civil War now. And he, he had no idea until he'd done the, you know, it's the, the PBS series, you know, Finding Your Ancestors and Finding Your Roots, I think it's called. So uh, he's a bona fide Civil War, you know, hero descendant now, so. But so it was an interesting after, experience. So then after you had that opportunity to to work with Jeff and, and create mm -hmm. that character, you then find yourself career-wise in Gettysburg to kind of see the the impact of your work and, and what the film had done. What was it like to show up in Gettysburg and, and work at the park and suddenly kind of see what that movie had created? It, it was, a, I, I went uh, February of 95 to the Park Library to do some research. And Scott Hartwig and I, who was the, chief, the supervisory historian then, and I became friends. And that February, he said, what are you doing this summer? And I said, yeah, I got to write my dissertation. His classwork's done. I just got to write my dissertation, which he knew was about the 20th in the battle. And, he's, and I said, I, you know, I just got to be in front of a computer somewhere. And he said, well, how'd you like to come out here? And I said, okay. And he said, we'll put you up in the house of the battlefield. And, you know, you volunteer four days a week in the library and we'll do this and that. And I thought, that sounds wonderful. So <clears throat> the summer came and went and I had a blast. And then in the fall, they said, you know, we'll find some money. We'll keep you around. If you keep, I, I rebuilt the park library collection. It was the old card catalog with your fingers. All right. And we computerized it so you could, you know, type in searches and a ton of volunteer efforts. And, um, started the park watch thing, did a bunch of fun things, started a garden in Lydia, Lydia Leister's at, at Meade's headquarters. Uh, the poor woman was giving her um, her presentation in costume as Lydia Leister would talk about her garden and there wasn't one. So I decided that there has to be a garden there and I planted one and bad one. And, um, and so she could, you know, so it's just all of those little fun things. Um, were a blast. And um, so I got to know the place and the people and, um, um, after a couple of years, uh, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go home now. I'm done with the park. I got to go really, I wanted to, you know, 
continue to study Maine and write about Maine history back in Maine. And, and so a publisher that had done my first book um, said, you know, we could really use some help with marketing and this and that. And I'm like, oh, I'll try it for a while, but I'm, you know. So I did that for two years. And, um, and then I was like, okay, I'm going home. I'm done. I'm, you know, this wasn't my plan. I'm having a good time, but. And then a, it's, it's defunct now, but Greystone Communications, a television company that did a lot of History Channel and, and a &E biographies and stuff, said, we could really use some help. And then it's, oh, geez. <laughs> so I ended up staying another two years, right? So look, I'm going home. And it was six years that I got to spend just wallowing in all things Gettysburg. But but it was getting off the bus when it, so to speak, it was actually my Jeep Cherokee. But I drove in in June of, I think I landed on my birthday in June of 95 and got out of my car and the Chamberlain mania hit me right in the face. It was absolutely bizarre. I didn't realize from up in Maine that it had become such a big deal. The movie had come out in 93, um, bombed horribly at the box office. Um, and I, I guess it had aired by then on Ted Turner's network. And it is still to this day, the number one, to the extent anyone can collect these records, uh, the most watched at 41 million viewers over two nights. It was the most watched drama in cable television history. And uh, ironically, the second um, most popular one is the Florida State National Championship game. And as a Florida State Seminole, I'm like, hey, I got two for two. <laughs> like Michael Shara, of course, taught. I, I taught there as a, yeah, as a master's right. student and in the building next door to where Michael Shara taught English, Shakespearean English. So there's a lot of these bizarre accidental connections um, between me and, and the story and, and this. But it, I immediately held on to this story of what I had known about Chamberlain growing up, my dissertation and, and the, the true story, the one with diarrhea and, and dysentery and stuff. But and then saw the heroic, the, the one I had not realized, sort of predicted when the six foot two blonde, six foot three blonde hair, blue guy, blue eyed guy, and 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 saw how far apart they were. And it was fascinating to me to go, how do we get from this story to this Hollywood thing and the T-shirts and the action figures and the Civil War Barbie and just it was, it was it was truly bizarre marketing historian might have really enjoyed the credit cards and the pillows and stuff, the way people emoted in, in our modern age. Um, you know, it wasn't like Emmanuel Lutz's Washington Crossing the Delaware, which came out in 1861. It was t-shirts and pillows and clocks and, you know, period nightlights. I thought that was funny. They plugged in. I thought, I don't think that's really how they work. But so it, for me as a historian watching people just gush, over Chamberlain, and then the inevitable backlash of people who love George Green or pick a guy in, on either side who wasn't getting the credit for doing something as heroic or almost identical in Green's case to what Chamberlain did. And, and that was fascinating to watch people get angry, like downright furious at Chamberlain. Like he's been dead 80 years. It's not his fault. You know, it's um, so that was interesting, but I had grown up and studied and written a dissertation on the story and then walked into the Hollywood version, which I had sort of contributed to. And it was for me fascinating. I mean, you have a choice then. it's either, okay, I'm going to find out exactly what happened. I'm going to know how many Blake Magner studied. He can tell you how many, literally how many pounds of horse manure were left behind on the battlefield. <laughs> Doesn't matter much, but somebody counted it. And that's Gettysburg. You count almost as much as we count in baseball, you know, everything in baseball, you count. And everything in Gettysburg, you count the number of bullets, the number of everything. And so, you know, you can either, I'm going to find out how many eyelets that were in the left shoe of the third guy from the whatever, times 70,000 people, or I'm just going to study the people trying to figure that out or trying to explain why there really was a shoe factory when there wasn't or whatever. And, and so I just got interested in just sitting there after I was a bunch of us would take off our uniforms the end of the day, find a spot on the battlefield and just sit and listen to the to the fathers telling their kids and the boys, guys telling their girlfriend, you know, people telling the story, most of which was completely wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and laughing a little bit, but wondering how did, did that vein go off? Where did he get that from? You know, and how did, you know, everyone connect in so many ways to the battlefield? And um, so that was really, as a historian, just observing people absorbing and, and emoting and describing and 
trying to take part in their history. And of course, the, the visits of the battlefield have never haven't been anywhere near that high anymore. Um, they're a fraction of what they were that first and second year afterward. So it's just a perfect time to just sit there and, and take it all in. Um, so it was the movie had a, a real transformative effect there for a period of time. And, and um, you know, you, you can't undo the story it told and tell people it's not true. It's funny to me that most people inertly, when I would give a tour, I say, how many people saw the movie? Okay, I got, I got a con, we have a common context. I'll, I'll go from there. Remember when this, you know, that kind of thing. But in reality, um, when you then say to people, you know, every time Hollywood makes a movie, it's exactly perfectly historically accurate. They all laugh because they know that's not true. But then they buy into it and believe every little thing that was in the movie. And where did this happen? You know, how come Buster Kilrain's name isn't on? People like irate that Buster Kilrain's name isn't on the monument. That in my warped sense of humor, one day we printed out his name and taped it to the monument for a minute just so we could say it was there once. It's a sacrilege, I know, but it was funny. So, um, it, it, you know, that whole, uh, the way people connect with art and you know, literature, and, and in this case, literature turned into film, is it, another fascinating aspect of it. And how the, the same way if you were in Scotland, you'd look at Braveheart and how it totally changed the, the, the reality of the story to the extent we know what the reality is. Um, but it's it's been, you know, ever since quite a ride to just study the, the way people have inter, inter or related and reacted with interacted with the, with the movie and it's been really neat yeah, so i want to come back and ask you about that but but i know that you took a lot of those observations and put them into this book mm -hmm. um these honored dead which to me is one of the absolute finest memory studies ever written about american history i mean i um i can't gush about this book enough these honored dead uh, and and you take some of those observations and you know where's buster kilrain and you know super josh willard's chamberlain and you talk about kind of the impact and how that shapes our understanding of gettysburg in, in a much larger context um it was a i, I just really i love this book it's fascinating um tell me about the process of putting this book together well, it, it started, you know, when I got, as I said, I got to Gettysburg and I can either try to figure out how many pounds of horse poop and, and, and you know, know exactly what happened, which is impossible, or to at least try to, or just go with it and study people interacting with it and, and what that tells you about the past. And as you said, human memory is was a big thing when I was a doctoral student. Everybody was studying historical memory and so on. So how do we get here? You know, how do we go from most of the soldiers said, I have no idea what just happened to here's a, literally there was a guy, the bugler for, for Vincent um, Oliver Norton, uh, right after the battle said, no one's ever going to know what just happened. Some guy's going to come along someday and write a thing called the history, but he won't know what he's talking about because it's not possible. 30 years later, Oliver Norton wrote a 400 page book, The Attack and Offensive Little Round Top, with every detail of what happened. Well, how did he go from, I have no idea what just happened moments after the fighting stopped to, I mean, he didn't suddenly remember stuff. He he built it and we build our history by conversations and writings and sharing and thinking we're remembering when in fact we're uh, building memories. And um, so it's really, the I started to come across these stories of the, the Every monument on the battlefield uh, had to have flank markers, including the monuments. There's one road near the Pennsylvania Monument where all the units that were involved in the campaign but not on the battlefield had were allowed to put monuments because they contributed. And one of them, the 84th Pennsylvania, had to put flank markers out. And they said, we weren't here. We we're going to put them. Like, You're going to put flank markers out. That's the rule. Like, but we didn't have flanks. We were in Westminster, 20 miles away. They they put flanks out, and to this day, you can go stand at the flank markers of the 84th Pennsylvania, which, because that was the rule, and and the politics behind it. If he, if the people running the battlefield didn't, they would have opened a giant can of worms. They just just put the flank markers out and stop talking about the guns. So the politics behind it, Dan Sickles and his craziness, and and a fellow by the name of. Um, well, there's, there's so many casts. I don't want to start. It's like a Hollywood uh, thing speech. You start naming characters and you leave some out, but. Um, the people who controlled the story of the battle by controlling the battlefield fought and literally went to the state Supreme Court in Pennsylvania over where one monument was located. And, and a corrupt judge who was an invited guest at the dedication of the monument granted. It's just the stories go on and on and on. But what you find pretty quickly is most of the battlefield is it's not fake. It's it's not accurate the way people think it is. 
like this flank markers here, this must have been where the last guy in the line was like, no, the road's in the way. So they had to move it over. I, one of the first things that I got, they were in Devil's Den for some event. And one of the rangers said, where do you think Smith's guns were? And Because I've always thought they would be right there. I go, yeah, that makes sense. But why can't they be there now? And kind of laughed. He said, because they get run over by a Winnebago because they're in the road. I'm like, exactly. So, and Scott Hartwick said this to me one time, the roads have so changed our understanding of the battlefield because we drive. And we see the battlefield for roads and they were built to allow veterans to do that. And, and it changed things where things are and how we see them, which way the monuments face, for example. Um, and so there's so many things that go into what we think is the story. And, and in no, no more so than in places like Little Round Top and, and almost every monument at the high water mark is not in the right place. And there's this chain of events that explain why, um, you know, Armistead didn't fall anywhere near where his marker is. And there's a reason for it. And um, he fell at the wall. But then all the other monuments seem to be based on where he fell to, to be a part of that drama. And then the North Carolinians came along in 1990 and put their advance marker up and took like seven giant steps past Armistead because of the whole Virginia, North Carolina thing. And so the battlefield is full of these stories that have almost nothing to do with the battle and everything to do with people afterwards trying to shape the story to their their whim or their view of it. And it still goes on in literature and books and articles and, and so on. And so uh, I would just grab those stories as it were, redoing the park library and drop them in a cardboard box behind my chair. And um, when I went back to Maine, I just had this box full of these hilarious stories. Um, and uh, it was in many cases, they're just fascinating. And, and they were unusual, like, Ike and Monty, you know, President Eisenhower and Monty, who he couldn't stand, came to visit him unannounced one day. He's like, oh, my God, I really had to take him out. And then Monty keeps poking him to get him in trouble with the press. And he got him to sort of say that Lee should have been fired and the people in the South howled. It almost cost um, Eisenhower the civil rights votes. And just, it, you know, the, the, and the same battlefield where the Eternal Light Peace Memorial is was the scene of one of the largest Ku Klux Klan rallies in Pennsylvania history. There's a picture of it. So you have these people protesting, um, you know, uh, or meeting to discuss peace. And there were 200,000 of them there and 100,000 stuck on the road. I, President Roosevelt spoke. And then that same picture of a slightly different angle 10 years later is, is a rally of a bunch of guys in hoods for the Klan. On the same battlefield and the same symbolism, they just twisted it to their own means. And the story is like that. And, and it's not just the battlefield and the battle, but the Gettysburg Address. And, and um, Carter said um, when he was elected that night, he asked how things went in Pennsylvania. And they said, the county where Gettysburg is voted for you. And he said, well, tell the folks back home, Georgia finally won at Gettysburg. And, and President Bush, when he was elected, stopped in Gettysburg on his way to Washington like that night. It, it just there's so many of these stories have nothing to do with the battle and everything to do with this mythology of Gettysburg. And presidents have used it and, you know, marketers have used it. And um, it just is, uh, and it was amplified greatly when the movie came out because they were fed another collection of stories and characters and people that they could, you know, um, and an interested audience who could follow through. And, and so that aspect of it is always fascinating. How humans interrelate with their history to me is is a real fascinating part of it. And having just accidentally stumbled into this Chamberlain story and then the movie story, it's just, you know, this great story just sort of fell on my plate at that time in my life. So it was a great experience. So how do you think the movie holds up after 30 years? I, I think, about, and you know, it was what it was then. It, and that's just why I struggled a bit to not, it, it's a movie about a novel. And, and the thing about novels is you get to make it up. And, and people who um, just want to believe it's true because Shara's brilliance was his ability to capture the things that people really want. He was a Shakespearean professor and Shakespeare was brilliant at the same thing. You know, he took these two little teenage kids with a crush on each other and turned it into the greatest love story ever told. And so he took this story of a handful of Civil War guys who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg and turned it into this, you know, the greatest Civil War novel of all time other than Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so he had a way of tapping into the, the thing that people want to to believe and feel and, and see about the battle. It's not a, hardly a drop of blood. 
Um, I always still laugh at John Bell Hood was about 50 years older than the real boy general. Um, and you know, a lot of other things that are just fun to laugh about. Uh, the fact that one of the real funny things is that Andrew Tozier, uh, the color chart in the 20th grade has a speaking role, two, three lines. And he comes over and says to Chamberlain something about the second main men over there. Well, Tozier was one of the second main men, so he wouldn't have been, <laughs> you know, or when Chamberlain comes up and General Hancock offers them to order somebody to get them rations and supplies. They're not in our core. What are we giving them our stuff for? It's just these things that if you want to nitpick, um, you can. Um, if you look carefully, you can see General Warren's statue standing in, in the bushes on what's supposed to be big round top. And so I've always kidded about Tom saying to Joshua, there's this guy in the bushes. I don't know. He hadn't moved much. I don't know. He's been there a long time. You know, just, if you know the battlefield, it's just, they're just you have to laugh at those kind of funny scenes and limitations and things. And, uh, uh, but it was, you know, and, and I remember I decided to, uh, with two other friends, not to participate in Pickett's Charge the, the day they filmed on the battlefield. And all they filmed was masses of Confederate soldiers moving. It was it. There wasn't any fighting or shooting. The cannons fire. And um, they had this helicopter before drones. Um, and it was half the size of a car and it took a convertible with four people. So the director and the helper and a guy maneuvering the helicopter and a guy driving. And they drove along in the helicopter. It got some great shots, although the film's green, of the cannons going off right above the muzzle. And a, a second pass, I think it was, the one of the cannons hung fired. You know, it, it hesitates for a second before the power ignites. And the biggest piece of the the helicopter they found was, you know, a couple of inches wide. It, it was right in front of the muzzle when it went off. And everybody kind of looked at, I think it was Ron Maxwell, and he was like, hey, I knew. So uh, it blew this helicopter. Somebody went to look. There's film of it somewhere being blown up. I've never seen it. But, but I remember turning at one point, looking down, and I saw the top of the head of the person next to me. It was Martin Sheen, who was there with his grandchildren. And he had been a great guy. He had been released from the movie. He was done. And he stayed a couple of weeks to work with the migrant community in Gettysburg. It's, uh, Adams County is the largest apple producing county in the country. And a lot of migrants come and, and work as laborers. And he took part in that, helped out that community, stuck around for a while. He was you know, really helpful. And he stayed to watch that scene. And um, it was just fascinating to, you know, you get goosebumps. And um, Stephen Lang tried to, to stab me with a sword. It was funny because he, me and two other guys were in, in not even in, just vests in our civil war uniforms, like Union uniforms. So we were the only enemy on the battlefield. So he, you know, after the shot was over, came out and made a joke about, you know, finally finding some Yankees to kill. And the poor guy who rode, um, uh, who's Garnett, and rode the horse into the smoke and disappeared, um, was terrified of the horse. He was a stage actor, knew nothing about horses. And somebody said to him, oh, here's a guy who lived in Kentucky. I'm like, what does that mean? I was there for two years. I didn't take horse class. Like, what, how does that? Well, he had hung his sword on his belt in such a way that it was hitting the horse in the rear end every time the horse took a step. So the horse would be in whipped to hurry, you know. And his, he, you could see it in the movie. His arms are out. He's just terrified. So there's little behind the scenes thing, things that you sort of pick up. And they had one of my favorites, and I had footage of this at one time, and I don't anymore, but Ted Turner came for a day to be in the movie. In the mouth of the South, um, they had to find a role for him. And so they decided that General Patton's grandfather would be a good Confederate, would be a good role. As it turns out, in reality, Patton's grandfather was shot in the mouth. And we thought, oh, how appropriate, the mouth of the South. But that wasn't fitting for the movie. So um, he had to... <laughs> I remember the footage. He had to step through a fence, turn and wave his men on and say, this way, boys, and then grab the, the, the blood pack right after it blew up because they had him shot in the chest. And, and the director, Ron Maxwell, came and said, you know, three or four times, you just step through the fence. This you know, it's the simplest thing in the world. Now, this man ran one of the largest multinational corporations in the world, and it took four takes. And it was two hours in between takes to set up all of the reenactors and the explosions and he, he couldn't step to the fence and say, come on, boys. And in the final take, I think if you look carefully, the blood pack was clearly here and he grabbed his stomach instead. So he, he couldn't. <laughs> so everyone was just dying laughing that that they just couldn't. They had to have Ted in the movie. He paid for it, but they just couldn't make the scene, you know, work over the simplest thing. So things like that. that um, and all the reenactors doing Jane Fonda aerobics on the wall because she was there with him. And just a lot of silliness went on. 
And I remember saying to the guys at one point, I said, you know, you're missing the point here. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Because there were these long lulls of two or three hours between shots and they'd be bored. So they play cribbage and tell stories. And like, this is what army life was really like being bored to death most of the time, miserable in the heat and swearing at the generals, I mean, the directors, because you weren't in the shot or whatever. It's, this is army life. And, and you don't realize that you're experiencing it. And they're like, you know, you got a point. You find ways to entertain yourself. You find ways to make people laugh. And you just, these long pauses and these moments of terror when you're ordered into battle for a few minutes and then you, know, you go keep yourself busy. So I think for a lot of the reenactors, it was kind of an interesting experience that, that it, it wasn't entirely unlike, the bullets weren't real, obviously, but it wasn't entirely unlike, you know, in some aspects of being a soldier. So it was fun. Better food. So <laughs> yeah, better food. Yeah, for sure. the, <laughs> the movie's catered, right? Yeah. Uh, so one thing I haven't really asked, um, and it's sort of at the heart of this whole discussion, is um, the real life Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. um, you've done a lot of research, a lot of writing about him, um, some some outstanding uh, books. Uh, still, still finding new things to write about him. Yeah. Um, how do you compare Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the person, to the Hollywood myth? Oh, there there are ways off. Uh, the the th and and again, the the uh, the book was about a, a, a no you know the film was about a novel and a character in the novel. And you got to understand when Charles sat down to write the epic Gettysburg, you know, the epic Shakespearean drama, he needed more union guys because, as the old saying goes, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a really fascinating, funny, interesting Confederate. They all were. I mean. Pick it with his ring oil ringlets and just just pick one and they're all in their own way uh, interesting and fascinating and nutty and and whatever um so it wasn't hard at all to find the brooding lee and the brooding wrong street and then the happy-go-lucky picket they're just everywhere but the yankees were boring as heck and so you know he grabbed um uh he read about a cavalry commander who, who fought the battle and then died of exhaustion months later and held off the, you know, Ooh, that's a story. I can, I can work with that. And then um, he cast about for some of this supposed story between Hancock and Armistead because they had met and maybe for a minute in Los Angeles years before, but he made that into a, oh, they must've been close friends and blood brothers. And, uh, you know, he just made that Shakespearean way of making something out of a moment, you know? And then he found out there was this guy in Maine who had been a, trained as a minister and became this great warrior. He was a killer angel, literally. And, and the title came from, a in Char's mind, the supposed paper that Chamberlain had written about man, the killer angel. And um, so, oh, right, that's a, that's a story. And so he, he cobbled together just enough eccentric Union stories to just kind of match the Confederate ones. And so... And that way it's great. And it's, um, you know, fortunately, um, Ted owned all of the TV networks that could do free advertising for the film, which is why it was such a huge success on his network. You got to remember too, back then only 75 or 80% of people in the country had cable. So the fact that it's still one of the, if not the most watched cable drama ever, uh, when not that not everybody had cable, um, it was, was really a, quite a phenomenon. So, you know, there's no blood. <laughs> John Bell Hood's 50 years too old. Hancock was the tallest guy on the battlefield, but the actor was, you know, foot and a half shorter. It's just the little things like that, that that are just funny, something to laugh about. But movies are never, um, even as hard as Steven Spielberg tried with, say, Lincoln, there are still things a historian can pick apart about it. And, and it's just that, you know, people understand, I think, that movies are movies and they're not... Um, and in this case, it was a movie based on a novel, based on um, written by an author who who didn't have to tell the, the accurate story. That wasn't the what novelists have to do. They they take a story and make it entertaining and, and interesting and educational. So, yeah. but it's been, you know, it from my first experience when I moved there, it was it was it just bowled people over, and it was all the talk, and it was it did a lot for reenacting, it did a lot for historical. Uh, stuff. People saw a lot of books, a lot of videos, a lot of TV shows. I mean, it really helped um, put Gettysburg on the map if it wasn't already there. Yeah, and you know, as someone who has has spent a lot of time living in Maine and and know you know, a little bit about Chamberlain, I mean, he's one of those guys that you didn't need to embellish a lot 
in the sense of the the way the art can do it because he's a yeah. fascinating character all on his own he doesn't need to be blown no out. he is and you know almost every um 80 of the scripts in hollywood are written based on a model by a fellow historian professor really named joseph campbell he's long since passed but he, he studied mythology and and how the fact that ancient the Mayans and the ancient Chinese have the same basic mythology, even though they had no contact with each other. And and you just proved that that our our early myths and the way we shape stories and create memories are, are up here, not in our culture. We we do adapt from our culture, but there is this thing in us that wants it all to fit a certain form. And until M. Night Shyamalan and some of those people came and broke the mold on purpose and and made these movies that didn't follow the form. Everybody followed Joseph Campbell's idea, and and the the it, that movies have this arc that they you know they start and they kind of swell to a crescendo, and then there's this big moment, and then they kind of calm down and cruise out the back of the film. And Gettysburg was built for that, you know, it leads to this giant thing and Pickett's Charge, and then the aftermath. I mean, it literally was the, the battle happened the way the model, you know, for writing a great story says you should write it. And so it fit. And one of the reasons I think um, the subsequent prequels and things didn't do as well is because it, there's not that that innate thing that, um, you know, God's a general is as, as entertaining as it was. It's like, how do you rise to the moment and the movie kind of ends with Stonewall Jackson dying alone in his bed. It, it just isn't the, 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 you know, the way you map out a story it didn't fit the way our minds are look for or want to see in a movie. And this one did, partly because the story did and, and partly because Shara adapted it so well to that sort of model, consciously or otherwise. Um, so it, it's uh, it's held up and that it's entertained people. And 30 years later, we're having a bunch of folks together and and um, sort of celebrating it. And, uh, and people who, I know Jeff um, talks about it all the time. It's the biggest role that that he ever played or his most rewarding role, he's played some pretty good roles uh, because he played a person and that was, and it was a challenge because he knew that Mainers would be really critical of him. Um, so even all these years later, some of the folks involved would think of it as, a, as this big moment for them. And uh, it's been a long time. So it's, uh, you know, it, not a lot of movies you have a, a 30th anniversary of and people sit around and reminisce. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, great. Tom, I really appreciate the chance to sit around and reminisce with you sure. tonight. So thank you so much. Absolutely. So, let me remind folks, um, stand firm, ye boys for Maine, the story of the 20th Maine at Gettysburg. Uh, Joshua Lam Lawrence Chamberlain, a handbook, and Joshua L. Chamberlain, a life in letters, yep. as well as these honored dead. So uh, a fantastic uh, array of books that you can explore and find out more about the real story behind what we see in Gettysburg. So Tom, anything I anything I haven't asked you tonight that I should have? No, um, no I just think um, the, uh, I, I had still in Maine and have watched what's going on in Gettysburg, just on Facebook and places it's going on, but it just seems really neat. And the, you know, this time of year is great that uh, it's a good, the, the tourists have mostly gone home. And so it's a good time to really enjoy the battlefield. And um, so I'm glad that there's a, a series of events going on. And um, it's just nice that people still remember uh, you know, such a great a movie that had such an impact on all of us who were fascinated by the story. Absolutely. Tom, it's been a privilege chatting with you tonight. Thanks so much Thanks. for being with us. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks for being with us here on the Emerging Civil War podcast. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.